Tonight, we're going to speak about something, two very important things. These two things are gilesa, <coughs> defilement, and poeti, enlightenment. Please observe that throughout the day, during each and every day, the mind appears in only two roles, the role of gilesa and the role of poeti. These are the only two roles that the mind can play. We need to observe and study our own minds in order to see these roles which the mind plays and then understand them. And in this way, it will be possible to deal with kilesa. And then it is the development where the poti or enlightenment are increased and gilesa decrease. This development can be furthered. The, we need to know that the original true state of the mind is, all, is a, just a kind of knowing that we can call instinctual. And in that original true mind, there is neither gilesa nor poeti. This needs to be understood first of all. As we talked about last time, when the infant is born from its mother's womb, as it enters the world, there is only the instinctual knowledge. There is only the preparedness to know, readiness to know. But the infant is in, is, the mind of the infant is still neutral. It doesn't yet know right and it doesn't yet know wrong. It neither knows right nor wrong. It is only ready to know these things. And so in the newborn infant, there is neither poti nor gilesa, but only a neutral original state of mind. So then with this newborn infant and its neutral original true mind, the mind remains like this until there is some sense activity via the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind. Then when some sense object comes into relationship with the sense organs, when there is some object coming, making contact with the infant via one of the sense doors, only then, and then this object conditions the mind either towards, conditions the mind either to gilesa, defilement, or poti, enlightenment. So then when the infant is touched by some sense object, and then it has the, it reacts to this with a feeling such as, being pleased, when the infect, infant is pleased by something, then we'll start growing the desire, the craving for whatever it is that pleased the infant. For example, if it is some flavor or just any pleasing thing which the infant, which the infant takes as delicious, then there is this delicious thing, and then there is desire for this delicious experience. And then there begins to arise the idea or the feeling of an I who experiences the deliciousness, an I who receives, who desires the deliciousness. 
So this is how a sense experience, how sense contact can lead to defilement. How it, the process of conditioning, the defiled process of conditioning begins in this way. If the object pleases the infant, there arises the kind of gilesa we call lopa or greed. This is because in the infant there is no knowledge whatsoever. There is not one itty bitty bit of knowledge about how this process works. And without this knowledge, the infant is powerless to guide it in a correct way. So then there is, the infant is pleased by something, then there arises liking of that, loving of it, craving for it, it wants it. This is one kind of defilement. Or if the object displeases the infant, then there arises the gilesa we call tosa, anger. And so the infant has aversion towards that object. It doesn't like it. It hates it. It wants to get rid of it. So these are two kinds of gilesa that arise because the infant does not have any knowledge of how this process works. So at the same time when there is the direct, the side, the defiled side that we just talked about, there is the enlightened side of the situation. On the enlightened side, the infant knows only deliciousness and non-deliciousness. That's all it knows. And it, well, it knows a little bit more. It knows that it, how to get more of that delicious thing. For example, mother's milk. It knows how to encourage its mother to feed it some more. And so this is, on the enlightened side, the infant knows very little. It just has this, this very small amount of knowledge which is not strong enough to compare with the defiled side of things. And so in this way, the defiled side increases and grows because there's not enough knowledge on the enlightened side to combat the defiled tendency. If we examine this, we see that the developments on the defiled side are very strong, very fast, have a lot of fuel, and are encouraged by all the things around the infant. And so this side of things grows very quickly. Whereas the enlightenment side is developing very slowly. Knowledge is building very, very slowly. And so the development on the enlightened side just can't compare with the very rapid growth of defilement. It's very, very difficult for the infant to realize that greed is dangerous or that anger is dangerous. It, it hasn't had the opportunity to see the punishment, the penalty that arise from the reactions of greed and anger. And so it's, it hasn't the tools to deal with these. This, this further demonstrates or explains how the development of enlightenment is still too small. There's just not enough knowledge on the enlightenment side to guide life <clears throat> properly. So as the child, the infant grows into a child, the defiled side keeps developing very quickly and the enlightened side is always developing much more slowly. It's always behind. And so there's just always far too little knowledge. And so the, the defilements stay, continue to be out of hand. And then the infant grows, the child grows into a teenager. And this, this out of balance situation continues leading to many problems. Even when 
the teenager <coughs> or child is aware that something is dukkha. It may know that, it may see that there is dukkha, but there still isn't enough knowledge to see where the dukkha arises from, what causes the dukkha. And so knowledge is stu- still too little for the infant to free itself from dukkha or even the teenager. Whenever a defilement arises, it leaves behind a small bit of familiarity with that defilement. And this familiarity is this little bit of familiarity of having already tasted and sampled defilement is left in the mind, it's deposited in the mind. And this bit of familiarity makes it easier for defilement to happen again. It, it makes it easier for defilement to happen more quickly. And this bit of, this deposit of familiarity to, with gilesa is called anutsaya. Anutsaya, A-N-U-S-A-Y-A. And so, every time Gilesa arrives, a little bit of familiarity is deposited in the mind. And in this way, the Anusaya build up more and more within the depths, within the foundations of the mind. On a very ordinary level, it should be easy for you to see that if we get angry very often, we then become very expert and skillful mm-hmm. at being angry. And so on this level, it's quite obvious how the Anusaya works. And so because we have built up so much Anusaya, it's very easy for the various Gilesa to arise because of these Anusaya which we have been saving up <coughs> with great effort. It's very simple for lopan greed, tosa anger, or moha delusion to arise one by one, one after the other. So now we'll look at the role of the anutsaya. We can take for an example a large water jar, say a, a large clay water jar. If we fill it with water and there's a leak, a small hole, if there's not a lot of water, it will leak slowly. There won't be, it'll be a low pressure leak. But the more water we put in, the higher the pressure and the more quickly the water comes out, the more powerful it will leak. So the Anusaya work the same way. The more we, we build up these things, the more pressure there is behind the gilesa, and the gilesa arise more often, more quickly, more strongly. Now, the, sometimes the anusaya give rise to gilesa which are aimed at external sense experiences. Like we get angry at a certain person or a certain event or greedy for certain things. But another role of the Anutsaya is when they have, they're built up to a great extent, then that, that pressure which they have developed will arise without any external sense object to call it forth. There, there doesn't have to be any contact with anything outside of the mind, but just within the, the mind itself through the pressure of the Anutsaya there will arise sort of half-powered gilesa, half-strength, half medium-strength defilement, which we call the nivarana. nivarana. I, uh, and please, would you all give a great deal of attention to observing and knowing these nivarana. This is a very important subject to study. Be very careful with this word nivarana, N-I-V-A-R-A-N-A, and the word nirvana, N-I-R-V-A-N-A. 
The one NIV is a defilement. NIR, nirvana, is the Sanskrit word for nibbana, meaning freedom from all defilement. So there's quite a big difference between nivarana and nirvana. But the words are very similar, so be careful not to confuse them. What we're talking about now is <coughs> nivarana, a kind of defilement. When all of these defilements are gone, then there is nirvana. <coughs> so we can think of these nivarana as half strength defilements. The first of these nivarana is gamachanta, which is basically a kind of greed or lust or sensual desire. And it, it arises from within without any external object to call it forth or elicit it. And so it's a kind of feeling towards sexuality or sensuality, but most of all towards a sexual feeling that disturbs the mind. This is Gamachanta, the first of the Nivarana. The second Nivarana is Payabhata. This is a feeling of not liking, of ill will. If you find, if, you have, if your mind is disturbed by ill will or not liking, but you can't find the cause of it, you don't know why, or you don't know what it is you don't like, then there's a good chance it's this Nivarana of not liking. It doesn't need an external object or subject. It arises from within the mind. The third Nivarana is called Tinamita. It's when the mind, the energy level of the mind drops. The mind is dull, weak, lazy, um, slow, and it, is, it falls to a low level because it lacks energy and strength. And this isn't caused by any external thing. It's just coming out of the Anutsaya. The fourth Nivarana is the opposite of the third one. The third one is when the mind deflates and sinks. The fourth one is when the mind kind of keeps popping up, keeps bubbling and bouncing around, flying around. The third one is a lack of energy. The fourth one is when there's too much energy. The third one is like sleepiness. The fourth one is one, when one can't go to sleep. The fifth Nivarana is uncertainty about safety. It's not knowing, not being certain, having doubts about what is safe, about what one can take as a safe haven or refuge. This has, causes the biggest problems when it's doubt about Dhamma, when this uncertainty is about Dhamma, and then one is unable to find any refuge or security in truth, or in putta, the knowing of truth. And so on this deep level, this fifth nivarana is this kind of uncertainty about where spiritual safety is. But on an ordinary level, there is also this nivarana, and that is doubts about where physical, what is physically safe, how to, about what is healthy and or economic safety, physical safety. So this, and that leads to a lot of uncertainty, wavering, doubts, which can really disturb the mind and make it impossible to be calm and peaceful. So this fifth nivarana causes disturbances both on a deep spiritual level and also on the everyday worldly level. Now it would be very good for you 
to learn about these nivarana not from our words or not from some book somewhere but from watching them in your own minds the best place to study the only real place to study the nivarana is in one's own mind so please do so this is the first point of the first topic of tonight's talk the nivarana can be hard to to prevent because as we said they are arising out of the the anuttaya which have been built up in the mind however once they have arisen they can be gotten rid of through samadhi by this very powerful control and calmness of the mind which is developed through the practice of mindfulness of breathing so now <clears throat> that was the nivarana which arises out of the anuttaya but the anuttaya can also give rise to full powered complete defilements the nivarana are like half powered defilement but when there is some external sense object that touches the mind makes contact this can because of the anuttaya this will condition the arising of gilesa the this familiarity with gilesa that is built up in the depths of the mind reacts to that sense experience and conditions complete full powered gilesa this kind of defilement or gilesa that is conditioned out of the anuttaya as we just described has a specific name this we call the asava which can be translated outflows it's a flowing out from the anuttaya through mental development such as mindfulness of breathing if we can destroy the anuttaya if we can clean up these deposits so that the mind is free of them then the asava can't have nowhere to flow out from they have no basis and so there's no no asava when one is free of these outflows then one is an arahant a perfectly enlightened being a fully enlightened being in the scriptures the buddha usually des- describes enlightenment as the end of the asava and this is how it can happen the word arahan means one who is free of asava another way of lessening the asava is that whenever there is sense contact of any kind that the sense contact is controlled so that no gilesa are built are conditioned when the gilesa are conditioned it builds up the anuttaya when gilesa are controlled so that or when the contact are controlled so that no gilesa arise then the anuttaya lessen and shrink so this is another way of lessening in the anuttaya and asava so we can take this as a very simple and useful principle that whenever the sense contact is not controlled when mindfulness and wisdom are not there then it will condition gilesa and that gilesa deposits these little bits of familiarity which build up as anuttaya however if sense contact is controlled through mindfulness and wisdom then 
the gilesa do not arise and the anusaya begin to weaken and lessen. So on one hand, uncontrolled contact builds up the anusaya, controlled contact lessens the anusaya. Okay, so let's try and look at the whole picture. A newborn infant is born with just instincts, this basic instinctual knowledge, but there's no poti or no gilesa. But then there's a sense contact. And because the infant lacks any knowledge about this whole situation, this whole, the way these things work, the it, its feelings just go uncontrolled according go uncontrolled out from this instinctual knowledge and then there is liking of this disliking of that loving of this hating of that so and from this gives rise to the eye that hates the eye that likes the eye that loves the eye that dislikes the self then is born and so that self is a foundation for the rising of further defilement. So in this way, the anusaya are built up. And then there are also contacts when it doesn't go in this way and there is no conditioning of gilesa. And so in normal life, the anusaya are going up and down, up and down, depending on how the, on the conditioning that grows out of sense contact, whether the sense contact is uncontrolled and conditioned in a defiled way or is controlled. And that's how the anusaya go up and down moment to moment. So that's the defiled side of things. Now let's look at the enlightened side. When this process starts to happen and the defilement arises, then it leads to dukkha. And as the infant begins to experience and understand dukkha, it still doesn't know how to prevent it and it doesn't know how to control the gilesa, but it begins to, to see the dukkha. And as there begins to be more and more understanding of dukkha, then this leads to the arising of understanding or knowledge about, about that dukkha. And this knowledge and understanding of dukkha is the basic starting point and foundation of enlightenment or the development on the, enli on the enlightened side of life. In a child, even in a very, very young infant, if there's some understanding of dukkha and its cause, then that is the beginning of enlightenment. So enlightenment begins even in a very, very young infant with the understanding of dukkha and its cause. Even the knowledge that certain things cannot be eaten that if it eats this, it'll get sick, or it'll hurt, or the knowledge that if it touches a fire, it'll get burnt and experience dukkha. Even this kind of knowing of these physical levels of dukkha, even this is the beginning, the early stages, the, the little itty bitty knowledge that is the beginning of enlightenment. Now, when there is just one time that there is correct understanding, this also leaves a little bit of familiarity behind. And so every time that correct knowledge arises, that true wise understanding arises, then it leaves a bit of familiarity, which also can be built up the build-up of familiarity with defilement we call anutsaya. The building up of familiarity with knowledge, with right understanding, 
we call Badami, Badami, which is often translated perfections. So, on one hand is the, the built up of the Anutsaya. On the enlightened side of things, there is the build up of the Badami. The Anutsaya and Badami have are the same in that they are both a develop a building up of familiarity within the depths of the mind. In this way they are identical. How are they oppose each other in that Anutsaya our familiarity are def, is defiled familiarity or is familiarity with defilement. Whereas Badami are enlightened familiarity familiarity with enlightenment or with knowing. So in a child there are both of these developing Anutsaya and Badami. The development of Anutsaya of defiled familiarity is a low level of is a build-up of the mind on a low level. And the development of Badami is a high level of development. Both of these are happening in the child. The question is, which is happening more? Which is predominating? Are the Baramis being developed to enough of a degree that they can overcome the Anutsaya? This is the, the important question. So there are these two building up. And then eventually there begins to be a struggle between defilement and enlightenment or between the Anutsaya and the Badami. And so it's important as which one is stronger to see who will win the war or what side will win. Many people like to say that life is struggle or that life is a struggle. If we're going to say that, then let's look at it on a very deep level and see that life is a struggle between parami and anutsaya, between defilement and enlightenment. So whenever there is contact with a sense object, whenever there is this sense contact. If there is mindfulness and wisdom, then the parami wins, and enlightenment is the victor. But whenever there is contact that lacks mindfulness and wisdom, then the gilesa, defilement, wins. And so, this is how the battle goes. It's determined by whether there is mindfulness and wisdom or not at the sense context. Our duty is to support, develop, improve, aid, raise the enlightenment side and to not support, develop, improve, and raise the defiled side. This is our duty, and it's because of this duty that we practice vipassana. Here's a metaphor to help you understand it. In life, there is, has been planted a seed of enlightenment, a seed of poti. This seed must be fertilized watered, tended, cared for, must get an adequate amount of sunlight so that it can sprout, it can germinate, and then grow. And as it develops, it needs to be carefully tended, given the nutrients and water and sunlight that it needs and protected so that it can grow and develop and send out leaves, new shoots, branches, 
and grow stronger and stronger into a tree. And then it can put out fruit. We'll have flowers and then fruit. So this is what Vipassana is about. It's sprouting and caring for this seed of enlightenment so that it can develop into the path and the fruit of the path. As for the seeds of defilement, these we need to destroy. Dig them up and throw them away, burn them up, whatever. Or if they've grown into a tree, we need to cut those trees down however we can. And so this we also do with the Vipassana. With Vipassana we destroy the seeds of defilement and the trees of defilement and everything in between. Thus the meaning of Vipassana is to destroy the seeds of defilement and to support and raise the seeds of enlightenment. So take a look and understand that all the time in our ordinary daily life there is this struggle going on between enlightenment and defilement. These little battles are taking place many, many times in a day. And so we need to understand what is going on, what this struggle is, and what our duty is regarding this struggle we'll be able to successfully deal with this struggle, with these combats, these confrontations, when, by developing a clear, concise, detailed, wise understanding of the situation of what is going on. When we have this clear, precise understanding, then we'll be able to deal with these little battles that are happening all the time. In a general way, this means that we have to know about the four Dhamma comrades, which I talked about last night. These four comrades of Dhamma are Sati, mindfulness, Banya, wisdom, Sampachanya, wisdom in action, and Samadhi. Samadhi. If we're clever in developing and using these four comrades in Dhamma, then it will be quite easy to destroy defilement and support enlightenment. And so for this reason, we need to train, we need to send these things to school, we need to develop them, support them, improve them, these four Dhamma comrades, in any way that we can, in order that we'll be very skillful in these things, that we'll be expert and clever with these four comrades, so that they can be successful in destroying defilement and supporting enlightenment. There must be a sufficient level of wisdom developed. What we mean by sufficient is that everything that comes and makes contact must be seen as anicca, dukkha, anatta. So when enough of this kind of wisdom is developed so that whatever happens, it is seen, it is perceived as impermanent, unsatisfactory, dukkha, and non-self, selfless, completely lacking in any permanent entity. So this is what we mean by sufficient wisdom. Another way of seeing it <coughs> is that these, well, these three, anicca, dukkha, anatta, can be summarized by datata, Datata is the thusness or suchness of whatever. So, whatever that comes is seen just as it is, exactly, precisely as it is, with no delusion, no confusion. That is to see the datata, 
the suchness or thusness or just isness of of everything that comes. So when there is the tatata of things are seen, then no problems arise because of those things. There is no defiled conditioning arising in response to the things that are seen as tatata. So this seeing each and everything as just this, just that, just what it is, seeing the tatata of everything means that there will be no ignorant reaction of the mind of liking this, disliking that, wanting this, wanting to get rid of that, being pleased by, being displeased with, satisfied by, unsatisfied by, whatever that comes. So Dathata is able to control the mind, keep the mind balanced, so it's not pulled out into these ignorant reactions to things. And in this way, the Gilesa are destroyed, both the seeds of Gilesa, the seedlings, and the trees of Gilesa are dug up and destroyed through seeing the tatata, the suchness of everything. <clears throat> if there is constant seeing of the truth of nature in this way, then the bhadami develop and enlightenment progresses steadily and incre increasingly towards Puta or Buddha, the one who knows. Whenever you hear the word Buddha or Puta, understand that it has three meanings. The one who knows, the one who knows things as they are, the one who is awakened to truth, the one who is awakened out of the sleep of ignorance and defilement, and the one who is blossomed forth like a lotus blossom that is opened up to life and to sunshine. When you've gotten to Buddha, that's as far as enlightenment goes. That's the completion, the fulfillment, the perfection of enlightenment. The Gilesa have disappeared. They're completely gone and nothing remains of them. So this is the story of these two things, defilement and enlightenment. The story has its origins in the instincts of the infant. And when these instincts <clears throat> are developed with wisdom in the correct way, then it is a development of enlightenment and that enlightenment can progress and develop to its completion and perfection which is Buddha or Buddhahood. So this is our duty to develop the instinctual knowledge in an enlightened pure way to avoid and destroy the defiled progression of conditioning and give rise to, support, foster the enlightened development. Someone asks, why do we practice vipassana or why do you practice vipassana? The best answer is to destroy defilement and support and build enlightenment. This is our duty as human beings. This is the most wise and beneficial use of our birth as human beings. This is the most proper way to make use of this human condition. So you don't have to be afraid or have doubts about what will happen as this progress develops and is completed. As enlightenment grows, life naturally follows the Noble Eightfold Path. And when enlightenment is complete, then life continues. It doesn't stop, 
but it continues to maintain itself within the Noble Eightfold Path. But once there is enlightenment, the path no longer has to be developed. It just flows automatically from enlightenment, from Buddhahood. Hoti, or enlightenment, gives rise to right view. The understanding of dukkha, the cause of dukkha, the end of dukkha, and the path that leads to the end of dukkha. So, when there is poti, there is right view, right understanding of the world. The world's cause, its end, and the path that leads to the end of the world. When there, then poti gives rise to right intention, sama sankapa, which is right aim, right intention. It's the wise wanting behind whatever we do. And then there is, because of poti, there is right speech, there is right action, there is right maintenance of life, the bodily necessities, the necessities of life are taken care of in a correct way, there is right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. So from poti, all of these eight rightnesses happen automatically. And so the Noble Eightfold Path comes and flows out of Poti. So because of Poti, rightness, correctness is perfected. This path is completed and perfected. When this is this perfection, this rightness, this completeness is reached, then there is no more dukkha. All problems have been solved. The mind has no more dukkha, it's, never, it's not disturbed by anything, and it is free. This is the meaning of arahan. It is, the, it is human perfection, the completion, the fulfillment of human potential. And this perfection, the perfection of an arahant, all comes from enlightenment, from poti. In, we're all born as sentient beings, or in Thai, kon. Kon is the word for ordinary people. And it's what we're all kon. Kon also means to mix up. So, as Kon, we're just a mixed up kind of mess of feelings, thoughts, experiences, defilement, maybe a little poti. This is Kon. But through the development of poti, of right understanding, of wisdom, of enlightenment, then Kon, ordinary sentient beings, are raised to the level of human beings which in Thai is Manut, in Pali, Manusaya, which means having a high or lofty mind. So, through enlightenment, the low level of consciousness of an ordinary sentient being is raised to the higher level of consciousness of a human being. So this is, we make this distinction between ordinary low level consciousness and higher or perfected consciousness. When one is a kon, an ordinary sentient being, then one is under the influence of dukkha. That mixing up of, that conditioning, that stirring up, that is the, the spinning round and round of dukkha is the state of a kon. When, when one is a manut, a manusaya, or a, a truly human being, then one is out from under that influence of dukkha. One is free of the influence of dukkha. And that spinning round in conditioning is no longer going on. One is out of that state. So please, don't be just a kon. Please be a manut. Don't, don't settle for being an ordinary sentient being, but develop and perfect the mind 
in order to be a human being. Just because you have a body that is shaped like a human being doesn't mean that you are a truly human being. It's not a matter of the body of physical characteristics. It's a matter of states of consciousness or the level of the mind. So it should be obvious at this point that for Kohn spend all their time with defilement. Kohn or ordinary sentient beings are spinning around in a defiled state. Manut or truly human beings are in a state of enlightenment and life is, con is, a con is in a state of enlightenment. So in order to raise the level of life and consciousness from that of an ordinary sentient being to the higher level of a human being, one must understand this matter of defilement and enlightenment. And so that's why we've been talking about it, in order for us to perfect the potential of the human condition. Within the Dhamma circle of people, when someone says, you are just a person, or you're just a con, you're not a human, you're just a person. This is a very, very grave insult. It is a very nasty and insulting thing to say that someone is only a person, not a human. So, if you understand this matter of poti and gilesa, then you will be able to avoid being insulted in the way we just mentioned. That kind of understanding is not just an intellectual grasp of the words that have been said tonight, but is an understanding that is present on all levels of the mind, not just the intellectual wordy level, the level of conceptualization, but also on the deeper level of direct intuition. With that understanding and knowledge, no one will ever be able to call you a con again. So tonight we've had the intention to speak about gilesa and poti, defilement and enlightenment. We've discussed this adequately and so we'll end this talk and open things, open it up to questions. So does anybody have a question? <laughs>